Remember when I said in my last video, when a cold event like this comes, we got to start thinking boondocking. Now you know what I meant. You definitely have to make some major adjustments from what you normally are used to when something like this hits. I'm going to cover these lessons that we all learned coming up on RB Street. Okay, let's get right to it. I have to do this video also inside instead of going out around the, the coach and showing you a bunch of things because it's still too cold outside. You know, when I was in the military, we used to play what they call war games, simulated scenarios when you're in combat and we would check all the different uh, communications and weapons and maps and all that type of thing because we wanted to try to expose weaknesses in our operations. And when those weaknesses were discovered, we'd shore up those weaknesses so that in real combat situations, we'd have those bases covered. We don't wanna be making those mistakes in real combat situations. We want to be prepared. Doing those simulations and war games would make us stronger and more confident that we had our bases covered. So I want you and I to kind of go back these last few days and let's take a look at what some of the weaknesses were in our RV and how we prepared and these so-called scenarios that happened. We weren't prepared for them, or maybe we were prepared for them. So let's take a look at these things together. Are you ready? I tell you, man, I have been so pumped about doing this video and I'm really excited about it because I know it's going to help all of us. So here we go. The first thing I want to cover is the mistakes I made. These mistakes were, was a weakness in my planning. So the first one was, you've heard me say in my last video to fuel up your gas tanks, fuel up your propane and all that. Well, we did the propane. Joni and I's regular routine is when we're traveling, you know, we've traveled two, three, four hundred miles. We're getting ready to land at our campground or wherever we're going. Before I go to that campground, I always stop off and top off our fuel. That way, when we get ready to leave that place and go to the next place, I don't have to worry about finding gas first thing in the morning. So that has been something I have practiced these last four years. Well, when we came down to RGV this winter, I knew that we were going to be here about four months. I thought, you know, I don't think I want to top off with fuel. I don't want that stuff sitting in there for four months. I mean, I could put some stabilizer in there and I'd probably be okay, but I've got to exercise the coach anyway while we're here. So when we go exercise it, I'll go top off then somewhere around March or so. Well, this cold event came and here I am sitting with a little bit of half a tank of gas. And I know that I'm going to have days and days of where I'm going to have to use the generator. So I was able to find two neighbors that each had a five gallon can. And before all the lines started forming uh, in the gas stations, I made about five trips and filled up the coach with 50 gallons more gas. I could have avoided that. I mean, I was able to take care of it, but it was close because I mean, as soon as I filled up that coach with those 50 gallons going back and forth, we lost power. The gas stations were closed. They couldn't pump gas. So that was the first mistake I made. The second thing that I didn't do, and I didn't even realize this until the thing was pretty much all over, but I got to looking around the coach and I saw all kinds of items that were on drawing parasitic electricity from my battery. And they didn't even need to be on, like this uh, TV antenna. Joni and I don't even watch TV in the daytime. We're, we're doing other things, but I didn't turn off that antenna. So that thing is sitting there all day long, drawing, drawing um, amperage off the battery. Now, granted, it's probably a little amperage, but you do that with four or five things, and all of a sudden you're talking about some significant amperage draw off the batteries that is totally unnecessary. I just happened to forget. So those were the two things that I did that I really should not have done. I mean, I know better, uh, but, you know, stuff happens, right? We're all human. So let's get started with conserving power. That's a biggie. And most of us didn't have any electricity, did we? So now we're dependent on our batteries and our generator to recharge our batteries. So here are some ways we can be frugal with our power, with our batteries, 
And if you guys along this discussion here, if you have some suggestions on what you did, any little tips and tricks that you do or have discovered, please let me know down in the comment section. That way I get to know what you did and you can share that information with all of us. Okay, first tip, number one, use your generator in the daytime. Remember to follow the quiet rules when you're running your generator. I mean, nobody likes to hear a generator running at nighttime, you know, when you're trying to sleep and everything and your neighbors are trying to sleep and you get a lot of RVs running their generator in a, in a confined area or lined up all in a, a campground, that can be pretty annoying. So try to schedule yourself to do it in the daytime. When you're, when you're running your generator, you are charging your batteries. That's in the daytime. Then at nighttime is when you use your batteries to run your furnace and anything else, your lights and what have you. But another time to use your generator is when you are at dinner time. Okay, so during the day you're running your generator and you may, it may take you four hours, it may take, take you six hours, it just may depend on the size of your battery bay. But a time to really do it for sure is during dinner time. And that way you've got power coming into the coach, you can use your microwave, you can use your floor uh, heaters, your electric heaters, you can be watching TV because you're bringing in full power into the coach. And at the same time, you're charging your batteries. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you're using your generator, try to use it in times where you can maximize your generator time. Number two, if you use your inverter, as soon as you turn that thing on, it immediately begins to draw power from the batteries. Whether you're using anything from there or not, our inverter pulls 7.1 amps just by turning it on. Wherever that inverter is sending power, whether it's in an outlet or the TV or whatever, if I start using power from the inverter, that battery draw just goes up and up and up. And my battery storage goes down, down, down. Now, Joni and I, we watch very little TV. And during this event, we watched no TV. Uh, what we did is we watched Netflix on our laptop and we used our phone uh, for a hotspot, but we never turned on the TV because all that's going to do is drain the batteries more and more and more. We're not going to have electricity for quite a few days. We don't want to be running our generator 24-7. So it's all about conserving energy. Number three, turn off any parasitic power that you may have in the couch. Like the dumb thing I did by leaving the TV over the air antenna on. We weren't even watching TV and I left that thing on. There's a lot of other things in the coach that you may see a little light on or turning on a vent in the bathroom or whatever. If there's anything that is on and you even may have an indicator light that's showing you it's on, but you're not using it, you got two options. One, if there's a button or a switch there where you can literally switch it off or push a button and turn it off, do that. But if you don't have an individual switch, that area, that particular item, that outlet, whatever it is, if you're not using it, go to the breaker box and flip down the breakers. Just turn that whole section off. That in itself will save you some power because even though that antenna may only be pulling maybe 0.5 amps or whatever it is, you add that up with four or five, six items just sitting there, uh, that can turn into some pretty significant amps that can be drawn on your batteries for absolutely no reason. If you have a residential refrigerator, those things, you know, the big two door big boys up there in the RV, generally speaking, those things can usually draw anywhere from 400 watts to 700 watts off of your batteries. And that doesn't even include the defrost time. We have a two-way refrigerator. It runs on propane and electric. Many of you have got this same kind of refrigerator and, and we like ours. If we're plugged into shore power, it'll run off electric. But if you don't have electric, you've always got that propane backup. Our refrigerator wasn't affected at all. Now, when you switch it to propane, just remember, it still needs electric power, but what it does is it defaults to 12 volt. And now the refrigerator goes to the batteries and says, I need power. And it starts pulling 12 volt power from the batteries. Now, it's not that much, not near what a residential refrigerator will pull, but it's a nice thing to have. It'll lower your amperage draw, but you still have to keep an eye on how you use your refrigerator. What we do is we open up that door, get what we need, and we close it. Um, our refrigerator, quite frankly, uh, like when we're traveling, we'll get it really cold the night before. I'll turn that baby up to nine 
And when we wake up on travel day the next morning, that refrigerator will probably be showing, I mean, I've seen it 28, 29, uh, 30 degrees, but that's okay. We turn it off, we raise the jacks, pull in the slides and off we go and we'll drive for six hours. And when we arrive at our destination, that refrigerator is still nice and cold. It's usually about 39, 40 degrees with no power sent to it. It's just got the door closed. Number five, one kind of funny thing that we ran into uh, during this thing is uh, Joni and I were sitting here in our love seat and we both have reclining chairs and I put the laptop on a fold out dinner table thing and we were watching Netflix. Oh, I've had enough TV, honey. So we got up and we went to bring back in our chairs. We pushed on the side aid and the button didn't work. Well, that's because we have the generator off. And I said to her, I said, well, that's okay. Let's not mess with it. Let's just go to bed. Well, we got up the next morning and I come walking out here and both of these chairs were reclined out in the middle of the room. I kind of bumped into them. I'm like, what the heck? And I saw the, the recliner kind of stuck out. So what Joni and I, we had a quick conversation about that. We thought, you know, these things are sticking out way too far. So the next time we start the generator, let's pull these in some so that when we turn it off, that's where they will be and they won't be sticking out in the aisle. So that was kind of a little funny episode. But if you don't have electric furniture, you don't need to worry about that either. All these luxury items that we have, there's a cost to it. <laughs> Number six, and just as a reminder, we're talking about how to conserve power. <laughs> if you have an older coach, I don't know what year that would be, uh, probably around uh, anything previous to maybe 2015, somewhere in there. But if you have an older coach that still has the old incandescent bulbs in your lights all throughout your coach, you need to change those to LEDs. You've heard me say this before. Incandescent bulbs pull probably three, four, five times the power LEDs do. Now, the newer coaches these days, pretty much all of them will come with LED lights. But if, again, if you have older ones, see, we, we replaced these lights. I don't know if you can see these lights right here. Look at that. See that big bad boy? This thing pulls a fraction of what the old fixture and old incandescent bulbs had. So if you have an older coach and you still have incandescent bulbs, just change them to LEDs and you will use a fraction of your battery storage. Number seven, keep your propane usage down by keeping your bedding warm, like using flannel sheets, a, uh, a down comforter. If you use warm bedding like that, you won't have to run your propane furnaces high and use more propane. So you'll be able to actually keep your thermostat down on your propane furnace to say, I don't know, Joni and I, we ran ours at about 65 but we had a really warm bed. I heard some of you say that the other day in some of the comments in my previous video. You said, friction, that keeps you warm. Yeah, that works too. But sometimes friction's not always available. You know what I mean? Number eight, and this one was something that kind of shocked me and I wasn't really prepared for myself. So here we are and all the cities around us are losing power. That means the gas stations can't run. You can't go get gas. And the ones that did have gas, the lines were blocks long, right? Even though I said in my last video, make sure you top off your RV or your motorhome before you go park, like I always usually do, don't forget your tow car. Or if you're pulling a trailer, don't forget your truck. How many of you ran out of gas or had that kind of issue? Let me see a show of hands. Yeah, that's what I thought. So everything that we've been talking so far, like the LED bulbs and all that other stuff, and especially the LED bulbs, I'll put a link below. We've got a really awesome affiliate company that has any LED bulb that you can possibly think of. So that'll be below in the description text. So we just got through covering eight things that we can do and that we should be doing, <laughs> Martin, <laughs> to conserve power. But now let's talk about replenishing that battery power. You know, I was thinking all during this event, I was wondering, you know, I wonder how everybody that uh, follows our channel, I wonder how they're doing with their batteries. So I'd like to ask you in this particular topic, number one, batteries. Did you have enough battery power? Did your batteries step up to the plate and perform the way you expected them to? Do you wish you had more batteries, a different kind of batteries, maybe 
a bigger bank of batteries. I mean, I really would be interested to know how you fared this situation with your battery bay. And you can just tell me down below in the, in the comments. I mean, I really would like to know that. I'm sure that some of you passed with flying colors and some mm, squeaked by and then some, oh my God, is a total failure. But when you comment below about what your experience was, please also include what kind of batteries you have and how many you had. You know, the more information we have, uh, the better we can all understand what your situation was and like, oh yeah, that's, that's, they're talking about me. I need to fix this too. I mean, you know, it's sharing information and understanding the circumstances. This was a historic cold event and it was a teachable moment for all of us on really what our battery bay can handle. I know that I was really paying attention and I know most of you were too. But in any case, you know me, martinize your RV, maintain your batteries at all times. And especially when you see a cold event coming, because you know what? When you get into extreme colds or extreme heats, boy, your batteries take a toll when they're discharging or when they're recharging. It isn't the same when everything is nice and pretty. Cold weather can really beat up on your batteries as far as getting them back to, to recharging. That whole subject alone requires a whole new video, which I don't have. What I'm trying to say is, is really watch your batteries. I know they're tucked away in a bay or under the stairs and, you know, out of sight, out of mind, and you never really pay attention to them until, oh my gosh, I need my batteries. What's going on with my batteries? And I wanna tell some of you out there that have lithium batteries that think you got all bases covered. Well, that can be a problem too. Whatever kind of batteries you have, whatever kind of size battery bay you have, I highly encourage you to read up and really tweak that battery bay and know your limits, know how fast they'll charge, how much they'll drain, and that way the next time this thing happens, you're gonna be good to go. In fact, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give you guys a homework assignment. Get a pencil and a piece of paper. I'll wait. Okay, that's long enough. Within the next two weeks, I want you to study your 12 volt system in your coach. I want you to get out your manuals, read up on your 12 volt systems, whatever it is you have. Go to the manufacturer's website and download the 12 volt system diagrams and study them and read, read, read until you understand them. And if you don't understand the system, study it some more. Then after you have studied your 12 volt diagrams, how the wiring works, where the fuses are, what your battery capability is and all of that, I want you to write me a one page synopsis of what you learned. And I want you to send it to Martinizing Pass or Fail University and I'll grade your papers. And anybody that makes a 71% or above will pass. But if I see any papers that come in and say, oh, Martin, this was just too, I mean, oh, this was too difficult. I, I don't want to learn this. That's an automatic F and you'll have to redo and submit a new paper. How many of you had issues with your generator? Let me see, show of hands. Okay, yeah, I, I, I would expect some that would. Have you been running your generator once a month with a, at least a half a load for an hour? I'm just asking, no accusation here. What issues did you have with your generator, if you did? And the reason that subject comes up to me so right off the bat is because I just got through doing that three-part series, right? I just got through redoing our annual maintenance on our generator. So I when I did that video, I was kind of like, I wonder how many people are going to take this to heart and like do it now before winter, winter sets in. Because your generator is going to be the main thing that's going to recharge your batteries, right? Now, continuing talking about replenishing our power to our batteries, this is something that I ran into when we first bought this coach. This was a 2012 Winnebago, as you guys know, and we bought it in 2016. I'm preparing this thing to go full time, and I discovered that our factory converter was a piece of it only was delivering like a half a amp or a amp at the most to the batteries when the converter when i plugged in to shore power and now it's going through the converter and charging the batteries it was a glorified trickle charger at best and i'm like oh this is not going to work so i yanked that thing out of there and i installed a progressive dynamics 50 amp smart four stage charger 
because we have lead acid batteries. And what a difference that makes. It's a, just a huge thing to take advantage of new technology, rip out the old, put in the new. It'll love your batteries, it'll keep them healthy, and it'll charge a lot faster and charge a lot deeper. If you are having problems charging your batteries fast enough and you have an older coach or an older trailer or an older fifth wheel, whatever, more than likely your converter is incapable of delivering the juice that your batteries need. I encourage you to look at that. That's that weakness, you see. That's one of those weaknesses that popped up. And we want to address that weakness by yanking that old one out, putting a new one in, taking care of your battery so you don't run into this stuff anymore. Okay, that's enough about replenishing power. Let's talk about water. Okay, all about water. I'm going to ask you guys a few questions because Joni and I see you guys as friends and family. I mean, really, I mean, we're on our own. We're empty nested. We don't hang out with any family or anything. You guys are our family and our, and our friends. To equip me to better understand what you guys go through will help me to do the kind of videos that I need to do to help you guys on what you're dealing with. I mean, we're all family here. We all want to share. So I'm going to ask these questions. I actually wrote them down because I didn't want to mess up and forget to ask the question or say it in a way that I didn't really mean to say because that happens a lot. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. Give me your comments below on how you dealt with it or did you have to deal with it? Number one, did any of you find any weaknesses in your RV water system? Did you, did you find any weaknesses, any leaks, any hoses? Your water pump didn't work. You had issues with your water heater. I mean, a dripping faucet, a leaky line. I don't care. Did you have any issues with your water system? How many of you had water line breaks? Come on, it's okay. My water softener is leaking right now. <laughs> I, even though I stored it all away, when I went to put it back, it's leaking. So I got to go get a new a valve for it. No big deal. But how many of you had uh, water lines break? Number three, since dripping water out of the faucet is a no-go option because you're using your fresh water tank. Did any of you try to drip water anyway and find out, uh-oh, this is not working? Number four, this is kind of water related. How about cold air coming in from multiple places? You know I covered this before in another video, putting in extra insulation, putting stuff around your pipes and blah, 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 uh, protecting your waste tanks and all that. But, you know, if you do all that insulation on the outside, if you open up your cabinet doors while your furnace is running, you can bring additional heat into those cabinet areas and protect your plumbing inside. So I just was wanting to know how many of you remembered to open up your cabinet doors to allow that furnace inside heat to get in there. Number six, as we saw in many places in Texas and the whole entire Central Plains, there was no city water. And when it did come back online, it had to be boiled. So having your fresh water tank full was really important. How many of you started having your fresh water tank full before this event hit? Number seven, how many of you conserved water by using tubs in the sink? We use one tub for wash, one tub for uh, rinse. Joni will put about a gallon, gallon and a half in a wash tub, put some soap in there, and then about a gallon and a half in the rinse and maybe just a tad of uh, bleach in there to do our rinse. How many of you remember to do that? Yeah, conserving water. I just happened to think of this one this morning. So nobody has city water. If you're in a campground, the uh, wash areas where you wash your clothes, they're all closed. They don't have any water or power. So how did you handle washing your clothes? Or did you do what I did and just wear the same clothes for a week? <laughs> I'm just wondering. Number nine, how many of you remembered to have Epic wipes on hand? We've discussed these in the past. These babies right here, trying to conserve water, don't want to take a shower. You can either wear your, the same clothes for a week like I did, or you can get one of these Epic wipes. Let me show you in case those uh, of you haven't seen these. These are awesome. When you don't have water or you don't want to waste water taking a shower, even a Navy shower, ta-da, look at these things. Oh God, I just love the way these smell. I think Joni said they have like eucalyptus oil or something like that in there. But look at this. This is the way it first opens. And then looky here. It's like going into a Cracker Jack box and you get a surprise. Wow. 
Look at that. As you rub your hair, clean your hair, clean your body, and also those special areas, and then you just take it and you throw it away. That's a great way to take care of getting a shower when you don't want to use water. You ready for the next one? <laughs> Let's talk about eating and drinking. Oh my God, did you see what was happening at the grocery stores? I didn't even think of this. I don't know why, I just didn't. As it started to warm up a little bit and some stores were getting power, uh, Joni and I said, we better go to the store and pick up a few things, right? So we had our list, we go to the store and we walked in, the produce was gone, the meat was gone, the deli was shut down, all of the cheeses and the dairy, the frozen foods, it was all gone. It was just like last March when all of this stuff broke out all over the country. I immediately thought, oh my, I sure hope everybody's not making a run on groceries again. But yeah, they took all that stuff out of there and put it in reefer trucks and took it off. So we started going down the middle of the store. They did not make a run on the canned goods and thank God they didn't run on the toilet paper. Whew! I told Joni, I said, man, I wonder how many people on our channel prepared for the food. I wonder if they had enough food. I would just like to know, you know, again, comments down below. Did you find a food an issue? Did you have enough food and heat soup on the stovetop and used your grill outside so you didn't have to use the microwave and all these other things that draw a lot of power? We have to rely on this minimalist type of living. I'd just like to know what you guys did. Now, that's what we did. I tell you what, I've had just about my share of potted meat, you know? I mean, a man can only live so much on potted meat. These are the things to do, right? Stock up before it gets here. When you get your fridge stocked up, don't open the door unless you absolutely have to. Keep that thing closed so you don't have to start the generator and keep that thing cold. Now, I don't know about you, but I love my coffee in the morning. And Joni likes tea. But you still have to heat the water. So we both started heating the water for both of us. She uses her hot water for the tea. I use mine for the coffee. But I use a drip coffee maker because I love fresh drip coffee. And it's easy to clean. I just lift up the, the filter out of the beaker, throw it away, and it takes very minimal water to wash it out and get it ready for the next day. But that's just another thing to think about. We always do it this way, but oh man, doing it that way, I'm using a lot of power and I'm using a lot of water. I'd like to know what, you know, what creative things that you did on how you minimize that power and water and still were able to eat and clean and do all the things that you do. This RV life is just all full of obstacles, isn't it? Personally, I think being in an RV during this historic cold event, in my opinion, I think it was probably the best place to be to go through something like this. Just think about it. If you were in a house right now, all the food in your refrigerator would be toast. It's done. You have no power to keep it cold. Unless, of course, you may have had a, a, a generator outside. Very few people have that. You don't have a propane backup system. You don't have battery storage to power the lights and all these other things. People who have owned homes in this big old swath of this historic event, I'm telling you what, man, they are going through hell right now. Uh, the stuff they've lost and broken pipes, it couldn't stay warm. And I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a tough deal, man. But I think again, being in a motorhome or a fifth wheel or an RV where you're self-contained, I think is a really, really good choice. Even though it has its own obstacles, right? You know, I, uh, I learned a saying long time ago. Um, I don't remember where I learned it. This saying goes like this. You may have heard it. There are three types of people out there. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people that go, what the heck happened? And I know that you guys are in the first group. You guys want to make things happen because if you didn't, you wouldn't be sitting here watching these videos. You're watching these videos because you want to better yourself. You want to learn. You want to uh, get rid of the weaknesses in your RV. You want to enjoy things. You want to learn how to take care of things and all that. So you definitely are in group number one. So what I suggest, since we all have gone through this stuff, we all get a pencil and paper and we write down the things that we spotted that were weaknesses. Things that we didn't prepare for, like me not filling up the darn gas tank before I got here. I mean, this is something that I know I should do. I always do, but I didn't do it this time. And that 
you know, I had to pay a price for that. I had to make five trips to the gas station with gas cans. But make a list of the things that you could do to make your RV better, habits that you could do that would make your living better. And then don't get overwhelmed and go, oh my God, I got so much to do. Don't do that. Take one item at a time, okay? And methodically think it through what I need to do, research it out, go buy what you need to buy, and knock that thing out and check it off the list. And you don't have to worry about that no more. Don't forget, guys, if you like this maintenance stuff, fixing stuff, DIY, and, and upgrading, and all that kind of stuff, you've got to go to my playlist right up here. And I have got a ton of videos in that playlist that covers a multitude of subjects. And I know they'll be really helpful to you. So don't be afraid to go to that playlist and check them out. Also, if you guys like this stuff, don't forget to subscribe. Subscribing to our channel is free. I mean, can you believe this stuff? I do this for free. All you gotta do is click the movie and you watch. I'm doing all the work here. But don't forget to subscribe. And remember, ring that bell off to the right and click all. What does all mean? It means I wanna be notified all the time when Martin uploads his next video so I can learn some more. So don't forget that. Subscribe, click all. The more you work on your coach, the more you're going to know your coach. And you're not going to have to call a mobile tech that's going to charge you 125 bucks an hour to come and help you or take it to the dealer and let it sit out there in a the lot for three or four weeks or more until they feel it's time to get around to help you. Don't forget to go down below in the description area where all the links that I've talked about in this video, they're all going to be down there. I've always got additional information down there. You know, there's one way you could really say thank you, Martin, for making these videos and helping the RV community. And that would be to use our links to the stuff you need from our Amazon store. That will be down below too. That would be awesome if you would use our store. I hope this video has helped you and inspired you to tackle and conquer and fix the weaknesses uh, that this 2021 historic cold event displayed in full color. You guys can do this stuff. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Take your time. You can do these things. Now get to work and get your RV martinized. So until next time, this is RV Street. Stick around.